Good afternoon. Welcome everyone. Uh, we are here in this uh, regional platform for the prevention of disasters and risks. Our goal for our society would be to have an equitable and resilient future. Three months away from the midterm review uh, and of the high level meeting to take place in New York, we are reflecting today about our findings, trying to find more equity in the Americas. The region has made significant progress in terms of risk reduction, and the main findings and recommendations of the midterm review um, have been worked with. However, there are still significant challenges in order to be able to achieve significant results. To confront our efforts, uh, has, it's a process that has improved. Our concept of risk has evolved. However, the amount of people affected has increased as well. Disasters have uh, had a more significant impact on our society, so we have a great challenge ahead. We need to be able to identify and classify disasters and to assess uh, social vulnerability and disasters and risk. And this is increasingly important. This, is, this session has the purpose of balancing uh, our efforts and uh, the objectives reach at global and regional level to understand the specific opportunities we still need to um, work on. We will listen to our experts of our distinguished panel. We will go deeper into some of these ideas of how to improve disaster risk and risk reduction in our societies. You can send your questions to the panel if you connect to slido.com. Using your mobile phones, you can insert the code, enter the code that you see on the screen, then go to question and answers and you should be able to ask your questions. So let's start with Stephanie Duran. She is the General Director of the Public Safety Department of Canada. She's a Director of the Management Policies and uh, uh, Agency REACH. She's in charge of leading the development of policies at national level, emergency management, um, linked to disaster risk reduction and emergencies, as well as the update of the recovery mechanisms after disasters. Victoria Salinas, uh, she is the deputy manager of the resilience area of the federal agency uh, of the United States, and she has worked a national and international level in recovery processes after big disasters. She's passionate about promoting the social impact and resilience on our societies in order to achieve equitable results. Sarah Sargis, she's the vice president of the risk reductions and resilience of the Canadian Red Cross. She has led national action to reduce risk and disasters, crisis and climate change, prioritizing unique risks to some populations. Uh, this includes a an inclusive resilience approach to emergency situations. So let's start by having the first round of consultations. And while we try to promote resilience for all, could you tell us, each one of you, briefly, how your organizations approach inclusion and equity in terms of risk management? And how can a whole society, an integrated society approach, help 
in this endeavor. Dr. Duran, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on this uh, esteemed panel and to discuss such an important topic. First of all, let me just start by saying a few important facts. Disasters impact individuals and communities at varying degrees. And again, it depends on their vulnerabilities, their capabilities, as well as numerous social factors. Again, emergencies, as we've talked about during this conference, have a disproportionate impact on vulnerable populations. That includes, um, it impacts indigenous peoples differently, at greater degree, women, seniors, visible minorities, new immigrants, low-income individuals, LGBTQ people, as well as youth and homeless people. Again, people with disabilities and people living in geographical areas that are remote without having as much emergency services are greatest, are impacted in a more serious way. If we can turn to the first slide, please. Um, what I'd like to speak about is uh, the Government of Canada's approach. And one important piece that I'd like to underscore is that to advance whole of society approach uh, in Canada, uh, we really need all levels of government and partners to take part in the important conversation of addressing emergency management priorities. In 2019, federal, provincial, and territorial ministers approved the emergency management strategy for Canada, which articulated five key strategic priorities. And those priorities are underlined by the Sendai framework. So how we organize ourselves in Canada at the highest level from strategic priorities is informed by the principles and the guidelines of Sendai. Let me just underscore a few points. It includes enhancing whole of society collaboration and governance to strengthen resilience. That is a key foundational concept that governs the work in emergency management in Canada. It is about improving the understanding of disaster risks. It's about increasing the focus of whole of society, disaster prevention, and mitigation activities. It's about enhancing disaster mitigation and response and coordination, as well as the development of new capabilities, including strengthening early warning system and strengthening recovery efforts by building back better and building back smarter to minimize the impacts of future disasters. So let me just again underscore that at our highest level in our doctrine, recognizing that vulnerable people, equity, diversity is at the forefront of how we develop, implement, and monitor our emergency management priorities. Next slide, please. So again, as I've talked about, we recognize vulnerable populations are disproportionately impacted by disasters. That's a really important starting point because we're not all starting um, in Canada and our population is diverse. We're not all starting from the same capabilities, the same capacities, the same resources. So these impacts vary based on underlying social, economic, environmental, and very important cultural factors. Again, um, you see here on this slide uh, the examples that I've listed, but again, it's very important also to underscore that Canada is a large, diverse country with, um, I would say, very varying terrain, uh, so that um, how to reach our communities and our populations requires focused efforts. And again, our approach is underlined by the concept of inclusion and equity, as well as um, that guides our understanding of disaster resilience. Um, final slide, please. I'd like just to speak a little bit about the importance of how we identify and communicate disaster risk to our vast population. Again, um, our principles um, and how we approach raising the awareness and understanding is by targeting our approach on resiliency by increasing the disaster risk understanding and awareness throughout the country. The National Risk Profile is a tool that uses scientific data 
expertise, as well as risk assessment and capability assessment to help us paint a national picture of risk. And those assessments are not only done by the federal government, so at the national level, but involves robust engagement with whole of society partners so that they can share their perspective of risk and their perspective of capabilities. I would also point to the social vulnerability index. Again, we're looking at risk by layering various social and socioeconomic indicators. And this allows us to take a more targeted approach to disaster risk reduction by understanding the needs and vulnerabilities of our vast, diverse Canadian population. So by targeting these vulnerable groups and communities, we are empowering those groups to also take responsibilities in building capacity, working with partners, and again, working towards inclusive and equitable disaster risk reduction. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie, it's really interesting to hear this conversation and the importance of how Canada has generated these uh, analysis, uh, this focus on diversity, and that of course generates a more inclusive management, mainly focused uh, on a specific response and on, on greater prevention and detection of risk. Let's continue now and let's give the floor to Victoria. Victoria, welcome again. Within the concept of resilience for all, this is one of our FEMA priorities. Can you please share with us your perspective in terms of how FEMA approaches this concept? Thank you. Uh, uh, because my American colleagues already know what I'm going to say, I will speak Spanish. Um, this administration, Biden administration, has taken care of equity and climate resilience since the beginning. And that means that the federal agencies have managed their strategies in order to achieve these goals. Uh, so uh, you can see that we in FEMA uh, have a new strategic plan that, where the main goal is to make sure that equity for all, it is one of the pillars of emergency management. And this is not just to look at what we're doing worldwide and the results that we're having in terms of results um, for the government as a whole, but also to check our own teams and how our FEMA teams are working on it. So that includes the diversity of our own people. In the US, uh, in terms of emergency management, there mainly the, there have been white men working on that. So diversity becomes essential. We need a FEMA that represents the US diversity. So for us, it means two things, as I just said, in terms of resilience, in terms of climate resilience, we are seeing that um, the most vulnerable communities are those that have the greater impact. Uh, and that's why we're helping with science um, so that we can take the science of the climate to be able to support the most vulnerable spaces. And lastly, it has to do with everyone's training. In FEMA, we work all kinds of risks, extremism, extreme attacks, for example, any kind of risk in, will be dealt with by us. And part of what we're trying to do is in this program that is called Justice 40, you heard me talk about these priorities of the Biden administration. Justice 40 is not just a goal, uh, it means that 40% of the overall benefits are of, from federal investment are helping the disadvantaged communities, uh, the communities that have received um, environmental uh, injustices. 
So these, uh, this uh, Justice 40 is a way of creating an accountability framework because that can be measured. And in FEMA, we have different programs to do that. So every year we're considering that 40% of the overall benefits are being used in this program. Why is it then that people can't have access to these programs? Why isn't it that uh, they're getting to this goal? Why is it so hard for us to get to this goal? I think that we really need to go more in depth into these goals. We should be able to measure it and to see which are the communities that are part of Justice 40. Part of this program, as my colleague Stephanie from Canada said, is to make sure that people have the right information that they need, uh, is that they have the right tools to assess equity in climate. That means to have all the information to understand the risks that they're going through. Here you have one example that is the climate and economic uh, risk and information um, census. This is a census that we carried out last year that gave us the information at a community level, 14 kilometers uh, radius uh, of the community. And that assesses climate risks in all communities. And that means that people at municipal level can use very specific data for the territorial management in their areas. And that takes into account the demographic risks, uh, how to solve some of these resilience issues in a systematic and specific way, keeping in mind how complex uh, disaster risk management relations are. Thank you, Victoria. Very interesting. Um, it's very interesting for us who are coordinators uh, and planners of risk management. Uh, it's an interesting concept for our teams as well and how we can make sure that we reach the whole community. That is one of our goals. So this is a very good reflection that you have shared for our countries as well. Thank you. Sarah? Good afternoon. Within the context of the question that I asked, we would like to know uh, from your perspective, what is your view? We heard two government views. Can you share your view that is social of your country? And we would like to hear your experience in your country. Thank you very much. And it's actually wonderful to be able to follow both of you in terms of understanding how do we take the contributions coming from government, coming from governance, and coming from research, and look at how we apply it to the context of the neighborhood, of the community. So, you know, when we, when we think of whole of society and we think of it as an approach, I would actually like to flip it a little bit. I think it goes beyond an approach. I actually think it's our goal. If we're able to look at raising whole of society capacity to address mitigate risks as well as build adaptive uh, and coping capacities, then in itself we're addressing vulnerability. So my, next, my slide actually feeds directly into these contributions and I'm taking it down to the neighborhood. Because when we look at neighborhoods and we start to layer the mapping and we start to understand the hazards and then from the hazards, both in terms of the, is it wildfires, is it flooding, as well as the built environment, then we can start to understand how these events may impact on communities and down to the neighborhood level. And then we're able to understand based on potential impact, who may be vulnerable. We talk about vulnerability from a population context so often, when really the populations aren't vulnerable, it's the events that exacerbate existing vulnerability or contribute to new vulnerability. So the, the other thing I'd like to say is that 
while we take the, the evidence, while we look at the research, um, there's opportunity for civil society and non-governmental non organizations to also contribute. So this mapping is something we've done uh, with the University of Waterloo. And we looked at the layer of flooding and we applied social vulnerability. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I've got a loud voice. Maybe it carries. Um, sorry. So we, we, what we did is we looked at the mapping in an area uh, prone to flooding, and we were able to see where are uh, neighborhoods most at risk. And recognizing those neighborhoods are made up of individuals, but they're also made up of the support structures that are there that contribute towards resilience. So I've decided to uh, share through story, share through pictures. And so you have four photos here. Um, they are not just contributions of the Canadian Red Cross. I really wanted to ensure that we were able to recognize and celebrate the contributions of smaller organizations as well as uh, uh, universities and uh, research institutions. So if you look at the uh, top picture, uh, you'll see uh, it's a cartoon. This is a uh, picture in a storybook, a storybook that was created from uh, the Enrich, um, Enrich group within the University of Ottawa. And this is a woman, uh, Dr. Tracy McDonald, working with soon to be next week, Dr. Uh, Christine Pickering. Uh, Christina Prickering, and they worked with youth. They worked with youth over a series of years, and through that engagement, they were able to um, better understand youth perspectives on risks and how they felt they could best contribute. And this is one of the outputs. They actually created a storybook um, that can be used um, across uh, areas, and I think in across Central and South America as well, that tells a story about how you can be better prepared to face earthquakes. You also notice that you see a, it's a gorilla in a wheelchair. And so how do you also look at inclusion from a disabilities lens? And they address that as well. And so this is showing that youth aren't just passive recipients, but they can actively contribute to how we approach and we mitigate uh, change. In the other slides, you'll see a picture of some um, the one in the uh, top right, that was actually uh, developed with funding from uh, Public Safety Canada. And this is really recognizing that we talk about the risks and we talk about how uh, people interpret risks. And this was uh, done in a seniors group in uh, Vancouver. And what we wanted to understand is what were their questions. And so we set up a ask, ask the expert box. And seniors that came into the facility were able to drop their questions. And from that, we developed learning sessions. And so it's through their questions, their interests, that we're able to address and uh, define what are appropriate activities. I'll just speak to the last, uh, the picture on the bottom left. Um, and that's actually from the American Red Cross. And so this is their program where they've recognized that if we're going to understand vulnerability, it's not about a de um, just developing planning processes that can address. It's how do we try and mitigate the impacts uh, before it happens. And so this, I think, is a clear demonstration of inclusion because they are looking at piloting uh, programming that's addressing housing, hunger, and housing so that when those communities that are participating in the program face disasters, they are hopefully better able to cope and manage with the impacts. I think that here there's a very significant point that we should strengthen that is uh, the community leadership. We know that the communities, are, are the communities are the first ones to take the leadership and to generate actions to strengthen the role of communities to strengthen the role of local communities. And that is a very good action that I know you're, you're carrying out in Canada. And of course, this has to be flexible and adapted to the communities uh, in question and to recognize that there are many cultures within our countries and they all have very different codes. And we need to understand that in order to be able to have a better approach and to generate a way to manage solutions that can be the, delivered to all. This is a significant gap that we can see that we all have 
it's a way that we should all, it's a, something that we should all move forward uh, uh, with all the time. Victoria, could you share your experiences? Sí. Sure, thank you very much. And it's a, it's a very important question and um, putting into practical terms. I think this is what we're really looking to do with this, uh, with this question. Um, so first of all, Canada is not immune to a vast uh, variety of disasters ranging from flooding, wildfires, um, high earthquake risk, uh, hurricanes, um, ice storms, um, you name it. So we do have a vast array of disasters. And I think one of the key lessons is that we need to engage with communities in policy conversation and reflect on lessons learned from past events. And I think that is uh, the tip of the iceberg is never waste a disaster because there are huge lessons in that. And one of the areas where we're really looking to increase our ability to support communities, to, put, to support our citizens, to make sure that we are proactive in our efforts is making sure that we have information available at the community level. Information that will inform and support individuals making the right decisions and taking some shared responsibility in taking the right actions. So I would offer that we are advancing, again, a flood hazard identification and mapping program, which will help us as well develop a flood risk portal so that Canadians exposed to flood risk will be able to see what actions and what measures they can take to protect themselves. We're also very much working on advertising campaigns, um, educating the public with simple, user-friendly information. Again, not using generic information, but making sure as well that we're thinking about making them culturally appropriate and working also with Indigenous leadership in making sure that those actions and that work resonate at the community level. And finally, I would just say that um, the lessons that we are learning from past events, I think we're really taking that whole of government, whole of society approach and um, advancing uh, a national adaptation strategy um, where we are at the final stages of releasing a final uh, national adaptation strategy for Canada was developed in close consultation with an array of stakeholders, an array of academics, whole of society partners and informed by lessons learned from flooding, wildfire, heat events and other events that have stru struck our country. And one of the gaps that I would say as well uh, and what we've seen based on uh, what's hit our country is that there's a need to invest in exercising and training. Um, it's, it's fine to learn post-event but we need to learn and prepare pre-event. This is where we need to deepen our relationships, build the trust, and again, the interoperability across different segments of society. Not only government, but civil society, academia, volunteers, and really build this culture of preparedness. And it's really about building that culture and building that readiness that will be able to deal with what is facing us in the future. Thank you, uh, Ms. Duran. Um, this idea of sharing a preventive culture and self-care is certainly something that we need to focus in and where we should invest our resources. That's the difference between life and death. And uh, of course, uh, early age support and support of children, self-care, uh, permanent training is what really makes a difference and the preventive culture and training is the difference between life and death. Thank you. Victoria, what are your reflections about lessons learned in terms of re recent disasters, disasters in the U.S.? Thank you. I'm going to do this one in English. So we are doing many of the same things in the United States as our colleagues in Canada are doing. So I'm going to speak a little bit to some specific examples from recent disasters. And I also want to address head on what Sarah mentioned about whole of society resilience 
being centered in equity. We're only going to get there if equity is the center of resilience because that's where we are addressing long-term vulnerability and making sure that we're reducing long-term vulnerability that makes it makes disasters and events more impactful on people. And equity, the way we look at it in disaster response, recovery, risk reduction is not equality. It's different. It's not making sure everybody has the same thing. It's making sure people have what communities have that meets their unique needs. And so a whole of society approach, we want to be, I want to be very clear, doesn't mean everyone is treated equally. It means we've developed the capability to treat everybody uniquely based on their communities, their families' needs. So in response and recovery, this is much easier for us in the United States. There's tactical ways right now after Hurricane Ian recently that we are able to make sure that response assistance based on the data on where underserved communities are, we're getting the assistance evenly, getting their needs in. We had people going and working with faith, faith communities, with women, with pe community, people with disability. We're able to use data to get out on the ground, boots on the ground in a way that's responding that, and, that leads to more equitable response outcomes. Similarly with recovery, we've changed, for instance, how we look at home ownership in the United States so we can give more aid to homeowners who have informal ownership of their home. Clear title is something many of our countries deal with, even in the United States. In the colonias along the Texas-Mexico border, we were seeing people after flooding not asking for assistance. I don't have a FEMA shirt on today, but it has Homeland Security on it. The same people who do immigration control. And so people were, our dreamers, our, our US residents with parents who don't have citizenship, were not coming forward to ask for help. So we're able to more easily tackle those things with data in the recovery and, res and response phase. One area when it comes to risk reduction, we're still struggling, is in those slow onset disasters. Coastal erosion, permafrost, creating a, a situation where our native Alaskan villages are literally falling into the sea. Drought, and part of the reason we're not able yet to fully address that is our governance frameworks. It starts to fall apart. Data, science, is good enough that we know which communities need to think about, for instance, community-driven relocation. We have the science and the technology to help support community decision making around those things so that when a community wants to take action, they, they can. And right now, we are, we are working in a whole of government approach to figure out how do we better support that? Because the science and technology is starting to drive certain communities to want to take action. But then we as a federal family, as a whole of government, still have a very fractured assistance framework where it's too hard to navigate, whether it's post-disaster where there's actually perhaps more easy funding to access, but it still takes a long time. And pre, I won't even call it pre-disaster because these are slow onset disasters. Even in that, in that space, community-driven relocation is so difficult because there's so many federal agencies you could potentially navigate with different timescales, different authorities. And that patchwork quilt of programs has holes. And so the science and technology has gotten there we can do the scenarios for what people are dealing with. People know what they're dealing with even today, but we still have a lot of work to really catch up so that the governance framework, the programmatic frameworks are supporting people. Thank you, Victoria. Sarah, what has been your experience in recent disasters and the key role that the Canadian Red Cross has laid in some science and technology and reduction of uh, disasters. Thank you very much. Um, and actually, I would like to challenge all of us because I think we uh, come conference to conference, uh, we speak at our, within our own organizations and with the extended community of practice, and we talk about lessons learned. And I really think we need to really talk about lessons applied and hold ourselves accountable when they aren't. Because at the end of the day, where we're sitting here, we are watching the same issues reappear event after event. That's predictable. We know we're going to be making the same mistakes. So it's up to us to look at how do we take action beforehand. So one of the things I really think uh, is a priority to us as the Canadian Red Cross, but I think also speaks to the two points made, is that we need to really rethink planning. When we think of planning, so often our, our minds go straight to the governance 
levels. It's going to the federal or national, and it's thinking about the municipal level as well. And this is critical. This is so important. Um, at the end of the day, these are the support structures in times of disasters. At the end of the day, we already know we're living in communities that um, are dealing with uh, inequity, that are dealing with uh, populations that are faced with multiple risks that impede their day-to-day -day lives. So when you add a catastrophic event on top of this, then the impacts are just that much larger. So when I think about how can we really start to think about planning differently, we need to, as Sendai says, we need to move away from the emergency management, the response. The, we need to think about how do you look at the what I will call the four quadrants within a Venn diagram. How are we looking at planning for disaster risk reduction? What is the intersect and the opportunity to leverage the priorities of climate change adaptation? And then how do we understand that we will face risks? So anticipatory action, which we are all hearing so much about. And then recovery itself. Recovery planning is distinct. It needs to build upon what was done within the preparedness planning, but it needs to ensure that it's able to address those surge uh, requirements. So for me, it's about action. It's how do we take the planning, which sometimes is the easy part, and how do we apply the planning? And so in an approach that's whole of society, this doesn't mean just government. This means us as individuals and community members. So one of the things the Canadian Red Cross is doing, it's looking at how do we build awareness and understanding, one of the critical building blocks of behavioral change. And actually, it's, it's real support from um, the uh, Public Safety Canada to understand what does communication look like from a different population lens. And then how do we, based on the mapping that you saw earlier in the slides, how do we target so that we're really recognizing Recognizing these are the communities most at risk, these are the neighborhoods, these are the individuals that make up these neighborhoods, and these are their support structures. And so what we're trying to do is develop an approach, which was the last picture you saw on my slide, which was of a Canadian Red Cross vest at a door. And so we're building programs that look at how do we bring the message uh, door to door? How do we look at that raising awareness, but going beyond the awareness? People have to appreciate that's only the only way we'll have behavioral change. And the other building block of behavioral change is a feeling of agency. And that agency isn't just individual agency, it's collective agency. And so if we are able to look at a behavioral change model from the household, now move it up to the service agencies. So um, I'll speak very quickly, but one of the things we also recognize that in times of disaster, who do you go to first? It is your neighbors and it is your natural support structures. So one of the programs we're trying to um, ensure is in place is we have the planning maybe at the community level, but what What's the understanding of that planning at the social service level? And then how are we working with organizations that cert, uh, support communities at risk to understand their service continuity planning as well as their disaster planning? And um, I, I, I was in a uh, session yesterday and they talked about the UPS resilience bo uh, box. And I thought, wow, you know, in the United States, they have a program through the American Red Cross called Ready Rating, which is available for them to coast, and it looks at building um, uh, opportunity for small organizations, faith-based organizations, all the way up to larger national uh, companies to look at where, what is our starting place in terms of our readiness, our capacity to respond to adverse events, and where do we need to go? And so giving them those tools and those resources to actually build um, on their capacity and then see the change in terms of feeling um, uh, better readiness. And so these, I think, are critical components. When we talk about planning, let's not forget, in a whole of society approach, it's building, uh, it's looking at planning from all elements that make up community. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I just keep this very interesting concept that you mentioned to move away from the response and to get closer to risk reduction. I think this is key, it's a very interesting concept and we need to continue to apply this concept in terms of the difference that we need to make. 
in 2030, this means having a, a sense of urgency, a feeling that we should move forward and we should do it faster. We should run, not just walk in order to achieve the resilience that we need. In that sense, um, with one last recommendation, could you share your experiences in terms of how the initial findings for the midterm review within the Sendine framework has transformed this approach uh, for the whole community? Are there specific practices or lessons learned towards this midterm review to promote equity and resilience before natural res disasters or disasters in general? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would say that, again, before I start, I fully agree with all of my uh, panel colleagues here. And I do think that from where we sit, sorry, I'm going to have to take off this. It's, there's an echo when I'm speaking. Um, it, is a, it does start at the neighborhood level. And I think uh, I like that term, community. I mean, it, it's really about the people. Um, and I think all of our efforts is really to make sure that people can deal with the impacts of risks that they face. And step number one is to make sure that they are empowered um, and able to take actions to better protect themselves. And I think investing in that community leadership, those are the people that um, vulnerable populations will turn to first. So again, I think as far as the uh, lessons, as we reflect on what we are working on, um, I do think that we need to include greater flexibility um, in how we deal with disaster risk reduction. Um, it is about making sure that we have a scalable, agile, um, and interoperable system. And uh, I think it is about capabilities and making sure that capabilities at the local level are able to be leveraged. And that is not um, only government's responsibilities. And I think it is about, as governments, um, where we sit in uh, Canada, it is about enabling and facilitating this dialogue. Uh, this dialogue and call to action, um, because disasters will continue to happen. So I think we're committed in working, again, with uh, the Red Cross, um, other NGOs, um, and other partners to champion uh, the urgency to take responsibility and to understand risk. And a lot of it is about where people sit. So we need to find the right language and the right way to communicate. And that is not a one-size-fits-all. And we need also to make sure that we meet um, partners and co communities at the level that they are at and not assume that everything is the same. So I, I do think that um, this is where we focus on that gender-based analysis. For us, that means looking at it from a vulnerable perspective, adding a lens to the policies and programs that we design to make sure that it is culturally appropriate, that it takes into consideration the diversity elements of the people that we're here to support. So lessons, it's also about being humble and to be listening and to make sure that how we develop policies and programs that we are open and listen to what the true needs are. And to do that, we need to make sure that we're engaging and broadening the tent. It's not about closing the tent, but it is about making sure that there is that openness and that inclusive dialogue. And I think that's where we'll really be able to make an impact. Um, and again, it is not about um, only being a government responsibility, but making sure that there is that space to really have that constructive conversation. And again, to build that openness to really advance uh, appropriate, relevant, but I think again, flexible and agile approaches. Um, and that it becomes ingrained, that it's not an approach, but it becomes the way we need to be. Um, in today's uh, risk landscape. Thank you, Sarah. Very interesting, that integration work. That tells us um, 
about the preparation work that you have done that really shows a difference of what you've done and how we can minimize costs and final results. The second series of consultations for our panel is the first one. And I would like for you to share your experience, your specific experience in terms of how the experience, uh, how your institutions have dealt with this. So up to what extent we have learned uh, in terms of the implementation of risk reduction practices first. And second, can you share specific ideas of the role of science and technology in our, um, in the support of risk reduction strategies in an inclusive way? Should we follow the same order? Sendai calls on us to really understand risk better and to take action on that risk. Very, and, and make sure we're leaving no one behind, right? Very straightforward goals. And the good news is we are pretty much all agreed. We've seen in presentations over the last couple of days, the values, the different, the, the types of groups of people that we, we need to be focused on. So there's a lot of uh, norming and, and uh, agreement there, which is a good thing. Where we're still struggling, and I'm gonna uh, talk about some of our challenges, is that when it comes to really instilling equity as the foundation of resilience and emergency management, there's, there, we've been doing some things to understand the barriers because one of the first things you have to do is dismantle access to programs and resources and technical assistance, capacity building that enable communities to really have community-driven efforts and obtain the resources they need to create that better future for themselves. So access is a major barrier. We've done in the United States a lot of listening, information requests, roundtables, engagements to understand the barriers to accessing our programs. And at FEMA, one by one, we've been trying to dismantle those barriers. Things as complex as many of the grant programs I oversee require a very sophisticated benefit cost analysis that smaller communities can't do. You have to hire a consultant and pay them $50,000 to even apply to some of our best grants. That's been a major barrier. So systematically, we're dismantling those barriers that we've heard are creating access challenges. But we're also seeing that that is not enough. There's still a participation gap. When we look at who is getting our competitive grants, and again, many of the disaster risk reduction dollars or the programs from different sectors that can help contribute to disaster risk reduction are competitive, meaning communities at all levels have to apply for those grants, they have to beat somebody else, and without a surprise, jurisdictions, states that have more capacity have more resources to write better grants. And so there's a cycle here that leads to a participation challenge for us. We are seeing rural communities not apply to our programs in the same level. We are seeing underserved communities in states that don't have strong programs to develop that pipeline of engineered projects or transformational resilience projects that take a systems approach to risk. We're seeing a participation gap. And that's only solved through collaborative, sustained support to capacity building capability building at the most local level so that we can make sure that we are taking a whole society approach to building resilience and leaving no one behind. But that is a lot of effort and it's somewhere, it's, it's something we haven't yet completely been able to solve for, but we recognize that gap. And lastly, we're also recognizing the limitations of our own national preparedness system. In response and recovery, our national preparedness systems our critical lifelines, all of these things, tools we've created, interoperable systems, they work fairly well when it comes to response and recovery. We've heard over the last couple of days how important it is to bridge climate adaptation with disaster risk reduction. We've heard about health, the health sector, all of these different sectors that must come together to achieve our goals, but the governance system in the US, we have a national preparedness system, like I said, but it doesn't necessarily have all the players, all the sectors that are truly part of building whole society resilience. And so that's some of the work we have cut out for ourselves too, is how to operationalize resilience so that in the next seven years, we can look back and we can say, yes, we made progress. 
And one of the things that I'll, I'll, I'll end with here that I'm really excited about is a new law in the United States that got passed at the end of, the last, uh, of, of last year, Community Disaster Resilience Zones. It's an opportunity for us at FEMA, we've been required to identify the census tract, so our lowest level of data collection in the US. Our, we identified those census tracts with the highest risk to a multitude of disasters using science, our national risk index that we manage that, that covers 17 different risks, and look at social vulnerability, social and economic vulnerability to say, these are the, the community disaster resilience zones in the United States. That means they'll get a better cost share, more money from FEMA when they are successful. Other agencies can apply too, and, and, and they'll get better collaboration from them, but it also calls on the public and private sector to come together in these places to make a difference over a specific period of time, five years. So I'm very hopeful that with what we are learning, both on the equity front, but also on the climate science front, we'll be able to make a big difference in just five years by really looking at how we work together differently in the places and the communities that need us most. Yeah, for sharing your experience and of course, access would be the first barrier to consider um, somehow, of course, having a commitment from all of our governments uh, in, or, in order to tackle risk management. Uh, Ms. Sargent, can you tell us one of your recommendations and share your view on this? Um, I've realized that I'm appreciating coming, going after both of you because it's, it's an opportunity for me to also see that we are on the same page in terms of really recognizing how are we already trying to address some of the challenges we face um, and what are the measures we have in place, but also recognizing how far we still have to go. So when I was thinking about this question, I did want to bring it back to the actual, the original report on um, achievement against the Sendai framework. And the, the two, uh, I I focused on were 26 and 27, and 26 was little evidence of improvement in coordination mechanisms, and 27 was the continuation of silos to, that limit DRR effectiveness. And so when I thought about these two things, I wanted to identify uh, contribution. And so I'm going to speak to two examples keeping my eye on the clock, um, that we've uh, participated in um, as the Canadian Red Cross. And so one of them um, was that we partnered with the National Institute of the Aging, and we looked at the publishing of a report, Closing the Gaps, Advancing Emergency Preparedness, re uh, Response and Recovery for Older Adults. And those of you who have joined us from the United States, this might be sim uh, familiar to you, because the Americans through the Canadian Red Cross and the Scientific Advisory Committee, for who the Canadian and the American Red Cross are partners, did this effort in 2018. And what they wanted to do was to really bring the evidence together and to look at what are concrete recommendations that will enable us to understand how do we act on a common agenda. Because right now, we need to bridge the communities of policymakers, practitioners, and researchers. We need to be able to build supportive policies, technical, and operational synergies. And that's the critical thing. If it goes from policy and it doesn't go to operational technical synergies, we're kind of still sitting at lessons learned. So this report uh, provides 29 missions across six domains. It looks at recommendations for the individual unpaid caregivers. It looks at recommendations for community-based services and organizations, as well as health care providers and emergency response personnel. It looks at recommendations for care institutions. It looks at legislation and policy, and it looks at research. There's something for everyone. There's some each person, each organization, each institution governmental can take away from these 2029 uh, regulations. Um, and this is important because just like advancing the conversation from disaster risk reduction to climate change adaptation, if we think about seniors in Canada, we anticipate in 2068 that it will reflect 29.8% of the population, which is um, just a little less than half of what it reflects today. It is a growing population. The needs are also going to grow, and the opportunity to address is going to be that much uh, more uh, needed. 
The other example I want to bring is um, some work we did. Uh, we have a uh, project uh, uh, partnering and looking at inclusive resilience. And one of the populations that we wanted to ensure we learned from were Indigenous peoples in Canada. And the frame is nothing for us without us. We hear this expression in so many different settings, but it, if we hold this true to the, to the heart of how we approach our work, then we are able to ensure that our work, our way is culturally safe as well as culturally relevant. So in this, what we did is we listened. We um, reached out to 37 um, knowledge holders across Northern Turtle Island, and we heard their perspectives on how do they perceive risk? What extent do, does cultural knowledge play a role, and how does it intersect with science and Western, uh, scientific and Western science? To what extent do communities build on strength to promote wellness, uh, wellness to reduce risks, and what are the uh, opportunities and the barriers to affecting change? We looked at what we learned and we internalized it as an organization. And it translated to ensuring that we move from a system um, that is really, we move to a system and we reinforce, and reinforce a system that is people-centered. And if it is people-centered, we need to understand the community context in real time. We need to incorporate indigenous knowledge. We need to recognize the colonial experience on national, uh, nations and communities in Canada. And that moves me to me, my, you know, what's, what's my recommendation? Because in Canada, we are in a place of truth and reconciliation. And I think in, from an indigenous context, but I think from a broader context. And so my recommendation is for all of us, and I'm not sure how this will translate in Spanish, is to own our isms. We come from a place of racism. We come from a place of colonialism. We come from a place of ageism. And we have to understand that history in order for us to understand the starting place of today. And I think if we can start to have our truth and have that truth reflected in our design, we're going to be much better at having inclusion and having equity and having a whole of society approach. Thank you. Sarah. Let's now answer two questions. The first question, how can we integrate planning and uh, the integration of risk reduction? Should we continue with the same order? Can you ask the question again? Thank you. <laughs> Everyone. I'm sorry? The question was, how do we integrate disaster risk reduction into ah. local planning? Repito. Okay. Let me just go start first. Okay. Um, so I think we've talked about that um, throughout our conversations today. Uh, again, I think it needs to be reflective and uh, appropriate to the community that we are looking to support. Um, that is making sure that capabilities um, and the tools and to make sure that we understand the risks. Again, it's not to take a cookie, a cookie cutter approach. It is to make sure that it is community based and it is risk informed. So it is about making sure that we access data so that the initiatives, uh, the disaster risk reduction efforts are effective. Um, it's not about just implementing um, certain um, programs. It is to make sure that at the community level that they have the information, that they have uh, the expertise, because um, many times you know, uh, there, there is diversity in the capabilities of the various communities. So it is to make sure that we look at what um, is needed and again, making sure that it is informed by geographical challenges, that it is culturally appropriate, uh, that it is equitable as far as access to the funding and to the expertise. And lastly, again, based on the conversation that we've had, um, it is about data. 
Um, it's making sure that the information is available to make sure that preparedness and readiness is relevant to the impacts and hazards that face those communities. Muchas gracias. Sure. Go, go. I think the only other thing I, I would add is that um, when it comes to really integrating disaster risk reduction into local planning, one of the things we found is that in the United States, communities are, jurisdictions, municipalities are already doing so many types of planning for different reasons. The Economic Development Agency requires a community and economic development plan. We require a hazard mitigation plan. Our housing agency, another plan to turn on funding spigots, to, to access dollars. And what we're trying to do, and I think Sendai's findings really get to this, is we're looking for ways to make it more integrated at the most local level because communities are already looking at what they want for the future in a holistic way, and we as the federal family need to catch up so that the process of doing a plan for us isn't perfunctory, but we're integrating DRR into what they're already doing and making it easier to ensure that their plans, their community-driven plans that are inclusive already, are driving the rest of the conversation so that the plans get implemented and actually make a difference. I'm going to actually just focus on one word, and that was budget. So we have to recognize, and it hasn't come up necessarily in this conversation, except you know, in terms of the granting programs, et cetera. But for, in order for us to be able to Im implement on effective planning, we have to have appropriate budgeting. And the budgeting needs to go not just from the development of the plan, but really the implementation. And if we are committed to Sendai, then it's an implementation of a plan that is not just about response readiness, it is about the prevention. It is about the structural and non-structural mitigation. And that, I think, is where, as organizations such as mine and others, I'm sure, that are represented in this room, it's how are we ensuring and holding accountable the structures responsible for budgeting and to ensure that it is not, always, not necessarily influenced by the flavor of the day in terms of the issues, but it is really driven by the commitments that we see in policy. If I can just have a follow-up, because I think there's one element that we've not talked about, and it is about governance of disaster risk reduction. And when I say governance, um, it goes from, it's, it's a systems approach, right? So it, it starts at the local level, and the local level uh, in Canada is supported by the sub-national level, uh, provinces and territories, and then provinces and territories are supported uh, by the national level. But this is where what's tying it all together are community leaders and other actors, including the private sector and NGOs and academia. But I would just say that it needs to be a system approach with all partners, stakeholders at the table so that we're able to make sure that it is coherent and integrated. But if there's one spoke that's missing in all this, um, we're not going to be resilient and there's always going to be a gap. So governance is actually um, what really is important as far as disaster risk reduction. Otherwise, there are islands um, of readiness, but the system is not resilient. Thank you. Because of the time we have, one word or concept that you can share with us um, that somehow gathers uh, the ideas shared in this platform, um, what we have shared for our communities, something that you consider a strength that we've had in this platform in these last three days. Sarah. Okay. And I think that my, my word or my concept is, is stemming from what Stephanie just shared as well in terms of looking at islands. Um, my word will be um, a dream catcher or my word will be spider web because we talk about the silos and we talk about the disconnect. And so we need to move away from the siloed approach and we need to look and to see how do we put community, put individuals at the center. And I think that a spider web or a dream catcher is able to uh, visualize that concept. Gracias, Victoria. I'll take an adjacent uh, image. Um, or concept, 
in a facilitator and lead coordinator. So emergency managers across the world really see themselves and are the lead coordinators. That means you don't have to be an expert in everything. And that's exactly what we need if, as Sendai talks about, we need to become the translators between all of the experts so that we can actually be partners with and in service of what a diverse array of communities and individuals and families need to become more resilient. And so that's the concept I would really lean into is let's use the strengths of the system that we are part of to be the bridge and really start to be the connectors. Gracias. Stephanie. <laughs> I like all words, but I think what the word that I would leave us with is um, innovation. We need to work differently. Um, I think what, what resonates for me is that we need to think about how we change the paradigm um, at many levels. Um, so it is about how do we, you know, what is leadership? Leadership is different now. It requires openness. It requires, it's not a command and control dynamic, but it's really about being inclusive, open, and to think about disasters and preparedness with different partners, not the traditional way. So to me, there's a level of innovation, but it's also there's a, there's a need to be humble uh, so that all partners come to the table. And it is about that common objective, which is about preparedness and resilience. But that is a change in paradigm because the status quo isn't working. So we need to do things differently. Thank you. I will, uh, I will add one word, multiculturality a multicultural approach and this is a word that we have used in the last three days thank you so much the three of you thank you for sharing your experiences for your great contributions in this plenary session i would like to invite you all to answer the poll in the regional platform 2023 it's in the qr qr code thank you so much again for your for this debate and your contributions we would like to invite you to join us in the closing ceremony now.